Here, we're over at the Maitland Public Library. It is so exciting to be here today with our speaker and presenter. Um, and I tell you what, uh, doing these remote broadcasts are awesome and obviously a lot of fun getting to be on site at the library. So thank you, everyone, for showing up today. You know, as we come to this time of the year, uh, we think a lot about being thankful. and. Our whole team at Easy Photo Scan is reminded just how thankful we are for each of you all and this being a part of this special community. So we'd like to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving from Easy Photo Scan coming up in the next couple of weeks. Hard to imagine that 2016 is almost to the end. You know, though, <laughs> with this time of year, there is always uh, folks starting to think besides just the turkey and the cranberry part, and they're starting to think about special deals, uh, especially on electronics, and they've got Black Friday and Cyber Mondays. Well, I'm very, very excited to share with you, and you're the very first ones because we just got all of our information today, that we're going to be able to participate in a special Black Friday Cyber Monday event in a very, very special way. So. It's that time of year, and we are going to get started early with the Black Friday events starting on the 18th, and we will be continuing on through the weekend and then into the following week with our special programs, and we're doubling up the savings that we would typically offer on normal Black Friday and Cyber Monday. The thing about it is you need to go and download our new app, from the Easy Photo Scan app from the iOS App Store from Apple or the Google Play, because that's where we'll be pushing out the special coupons. Now, if you don't do that type of thing and you want it another way, please register for our newsletter. Go to easyphotoscan.com and register for our newsletter, and you'll be able to get the coupons there as well. And if you need any help at all, feel free to pick up the phone give our team a call, they'll be happy, happy to help you. But today, it is my pleasure to be able to be on site at the Maitland Public Library to talk with Colleen Whittall. Now, she is somebody special, but I want to tell you a little bit about the library that we're here at because it is very historically rich. This library actually was founded in 1896 with 350 books or 360 books that were donated by a local resident and that same house that you see up there, or the same location in the picture, in 1907, still exists today, right there on Horatio Boulevard. And it's, it's, it's awesome. It's nestled right between the railroad tracks. The 2 o'clock train just blew by just a minute ago. And on the other side is beautiful little Lake Lily. It's just so picturesque here. Uh, you can walk the lake in about 10 or 15 minutes. And every Sunday, they have an open uh, market for um, farmers, uh, market type of thing, and then they save Saturdays for art shows. So it's, it's just a beautiful, beautiful place. And uh, as I was growing up, we actually lived in the Maitland zip code, and so this was my library. So especially um, nice to be back to something that I grew up at in my childhood. Now, this is a pretty special place for me. But I'll tell you what, they've got some very, very special people that are, that are working here. And we came across Colleen Whittall, and I asked her to please tell me a little bit about herself and to describe herself. And she says, well, I'm just like a typical librarian. I said, what does that mean? And she goes, oh, well, I like to read, enjoy cats, and I love to cook. So I'm going to let Colleen tell you a little bit more about herself and some of her experience. But I'll tell you, she's very special. She's got a special background and training that makes her really uniquely qualified to share with us today about working with our libraries, especially from a digital photo organization, scanning projects, and presentations. I'll remind you that if you have questions at the end, please write them down, and we will go through. I also have a special guest with me. I have Diane Eurekio. Diane, are you on the line? I'm right here. Hello, everybody. Uh, perfect. OK. Diane, is, she is a member of the NAPO and APO groups, photo organizers, specializing in digital types of things. Uh, she and I, 
between the two of us have got a couple dozen of these library presentations down. And we met Colleen through one of them and put on a presentation for and then Colleen graciously accepted our invitation to do this webinar. Diana's going to jump online a little bit later during the Q&A and help answer some questions. And, and, and she's, I think, got a couple of questions for Colleen as well. But without any further ado, let me hand it over to Colleen. Hi, Colleen. Hi, Rick. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. That was really sweet. Um, so yes, my name is Colleen. I am Public Services Librarian at Maitland Public Library in Maitland, Florida. I'm originally from New York, uh, where I studied my undergraduate education in fine arts. Um, I worked as a graphic designer for a few years before I found my way back to libraries. So that's where I'm coming from. Um, and uh, we're going to go ahead and get started then, I guess, without further delay. Uh, so digitization events and library partnerships. Um, Okay, so a little bit about libraries. Um, there are three main types of libraries, academic, public, and special libraries. There's also libraries in K through 12 schools, um, but you know, professional staff there are considered media specialists, and their duties often overlap with those of educators. So for today, we're going to be mainly focusing on public libraries because that would be the uh, type of library who could hold a digitization event. Um, okay, so a little bit about academic libraries. These are usually located on a college or university campus and intended to support the curriculum um, and serve students and faculty. Collections depend on disciplines offered, so uh, these libraries will typically have archives or special collections department and staff that um, can uh, take care of their own photo or document collections. Um, special libraries. These serve the needs of a specialized profession. So that can include medical, law, a museum, government libraries, digital libraries, and even churches will have special libraries. So these will serve the specialized research of <clears throat> employees there and researchers. So um, often, they're not required to use standardized classification systems. And they may not even have staff, depending on the size. So. These are libraries that you'll almost never have, um, will be accessible to the public. They're kind of behind the scenes, you know. But on to public libraries. Um, so this is, uh, my most of my professional experience has been in public libraries. And as many of you probably already know, we're providing services to the local general public. You know, basic research, basic reference. Um, we offer a circulating collection, nonfiction, fiction, you know, and use services, which is increasingly popular. Um, right now, I think modern libraries, you know, we're focusing on technology accessibility and training, as well as educational and recreational programming. Um, you know, gone are the days of it just being libraries and you're not going to get shushed anymore, you know. Um, public libraries also function, you know, as a community meeting space and host a variety of outside groups, um, such as digitization events, but also Rotary Club or the League of Women's Voters. Dress for Success, and even Toastmasters meet here. So public libraries are funded through public sources, such as taxes, as many of us know. Um, and we'll be focusing here because we can hold a digitization event for you. Um, so moving on. Now, there are different types of public libraries. And I'm not going to really dwell on this because you know it really varies from state to state and obviously country to country. But I think there are a variety of libraries that you'll see wherever you are, you know, including a municipal library. That's a city library. And Maitland Public is a great example of this. You know, we just celebrated 120 years, as Rick said, uh, founded in 1896. And so we are governed and funded through municipal contributions. Um, I think most people might be familiar with a county library system. That's established by an ordinance of a county governing body. And those are the libraries that you'll see branches at. You know, Whether you're from New York or Florida, California, you'll have a branch of your library system. Um, then there's school community libraries. So those are governed by school boards, funded through participating local governments. And those are in schools. Um, cooperatives usually serve unincorporated areas. So that'll be two or more libraries. 
um, and governed by a board of trustees. And you'll find that in more rural areas. So again, wherever you are, um, you know, you're probably going to be familiar with a certain type of one of these libraries. Um, and for the purposes of a digitization partnership, it's really important to do your research and know that library. Um, you know, all of that, this information can be really found on their websites. It's the first place to look, you know. Um, a lot of websites will say about the library or history of the library or even policies is a good place to look. But if you're ever in doubt, just call. You know, um, a county library, like I said, might have an entire department of staff that schedules events at all branches, while a city library um, may just have one or two people, you know, and like that's, that's where I'm coming from. So um, a programming librarian at any one of these libraries, they're often coordinating multiple weekly programs on a wide variety of subjects. So again, depending on the size of the library, he or she will probably also be performing other related jobs, such as marketing, graphic design, web maintenance, et cetera. So just really call to make an appointment with the right person, or even craft a nice email with an attached um, information. So now you're in your library. Um, I think it's important to know a little bit more about who's working in them. So almost certainly when you enter a public library, you're likely to meet a variety of staff. But um, likely the first people you will encounter are paraprofessional staff. And these are the folks that work at circulation, checking out books, checking them in, putting books away. And I don't know a single library that could ever survive without these folks. So while they generally don't need advanced degrees to perform their job, they're essential to public libraries. Also, they can direct you to who you need to speak to. So just to ask politely, to speak to someone in charge of programming for adults. And um, oh, and as a side note, almost everyone who works at a public library can be considered a civil servant to some degree. Uh, many people do not realize librarians require master's degrees. And so these professionals can be found at the middle and top of the library hierarchy, which I have right here. Um, and directors are almost always seasoned librarians. Um, librarians can be found at the reference desk, but their main responsibilities often require them to work behind the scenes or even off-site. You know, um, a lot of public libraries will offer outreach events, so we can be found at anywhere between like local nursing homes or senior centers or you know, just behind the desk. So we're all over the place. Um, so here's a little more information about who does what in a public library. You will find library assistants at the circulation desk and librarians at the reference desk, like I said. Directors, administration, and managers will likely have offices away from the main checkout area of the library. And you may have to speak to them concerning your event to get permission or what other information you need. So just understand they're not going to be the first people that you see. Okay, so programming at public libraries. And the rules for programming you know, are going to vary widely from state to state and country to country. You know. In Florida, programs held at public libraries are often considered either outside groups or library groups. Outside groups are expected to basically run themselves and require little library interaction outside of setting up the space with chairs or tables. They're more or less just using the space. Um, examples of these groups include Toastmasters, League of Women's Voters, etc. And so on the other hand, official library groups are original events and classes scheduled by library staff and expected to serve library patrons. So we've put our energies into these things. And you can expect to have a staff member attend and or introduce the class. I think that the official library group would be ideal for the digitization partnership. You're just getting a lot more energy um, and uh, you know, promotion this avenue. But it is important to make the distinction um, how marketing and solicitation varies from library to library. Libraries that receive state or federal funding may have conditions attached that affect their ability to charge for programs or allow outside presenters to do so. At your local library, they might charge $5 for a gardening event, you know. Um, and that's a good example of that type of library. In my current role at a municipal nonprofit library, 
we accept state aid, so we avoid commercial solicitation at all events. Um, and you know, there are there is an exception for library-related materials, like an author can sell her books at a book signing. But um, as a rule, there's no commercialization there. Um, all presenters are welcome to bring brochures, business cards to hand out. Um, we're not expecting businesses not to mention that they're a business or anything. Um, you just can't solicit things on library property. But it will vary from library to library. And you know, that's a great first question to ask the right staff member. Okay. So now, um, now if you're ready to enter the library and to ask about a partnership, I think it's important to be able to better identify what type of staff to approach concerning the events. So let's learn some, some best practices to make the right connections. Public libraries create partnerships with individuals and clubs in the community, as well as businesses and institutions. It's a great way to cross-promote events and classes and also strengthens relationships in a community. Uh, for example, some of the institutional partnerships that my library maintains are with art museums, independent theaters, colleges, and universities. As for businesses, we maintain ongoing partnerships with restaurants, hardware stores, grocery stores, and even the local chocolatier. It really runs the gamut, you know. Um, at my library, we also welcome community members to make suggestions for programs, offer feedback. And if you're really serious about partnering with your library, I think the best way to go about that is to be well prepared. And that brings us to attending classes and events. And this is a really important um, thing to mention because it is the single best way to make connections at your library, just by using it. You know, if you're interested in partnering with your library for a digitization event, it makes sense to get to know their materials as well as the staff. So even if you're not a big reader, there's plenty of resources to discover. You know, you can check out the databases, and there you might see that the library already supports any digital, digital initiatives. Um, if you have time, check out a program you might be interested in. You know, that's so important because in this way you can see the space available. You can check out the format of programming. You can see the equipment that's available. You know? um, and you could also have an opportunity to speak to staff or other presenters about how to go about booking a program yourself. Um, oh, also, get on the newsletter list. It's really important. Um, all right, so let's say you have the skills, time, equipment to partner with the library on this kind of event, but what is your particular interest? You know, you'll want to set yourself apart. So it's never a bad idea to identify a particular area that has room for improvement. So this is really where I'm giving all our library secrets, secrets away. <laughs> Um, but there are a bunch of avenues that I like to identify, you know, that libraries will consider when selecting these programs. So it is important. Um, so generally speaking, libraries with a large retired or senior population may have need for a digitization event. Um, something simple, such as a photo scanning or family memory project, would be very useful. Um, libraries with an active genealogy group may be interested in a document or scanning event, you know, that focuses on a uh, personal collection and storage, you know. Uh, when I worked at the New York State Library in the preservation unit, we had a huge group of the Daughters of the American Republic that would come in. And they always had a ton of questions about how to store their materials. So um, that's a great avenue to look into. Another tip would be to check the holidays. Um, librarians use this reference book called Chase's Calendar of Events. And I'll have that on our resources page at the end of this webinar. Um, but this is a reference book that librarians and libraries use to find special events like worldwide holidays and festivals, civic observances, historical anniversaries, even famous birthdays. Um, an example of this would be um, the fact that April is Preservation Month, so a very good reason to suggest a digitization event. Um, another thing to do would be to look for themes. Look for a library's annual or quarterly theme and support it. Um, Maitland Public Library's annual theme is health and wellness this year. So I have been booking more programs that focus on healthy activities and habits. 
a library's theme or mission can usually be found on their website. And it's a really easy way to align your program with the library's goals. Libraries are also looking for programs that support their collections. So if you're looking for ways to make yourself useful to the library, check out the library catalog and see what books they have on their shelves. You know, for example, if you see a lot of items on photo restoration or digital archiving, that might be a good topic to suggest. Check the website, too. Does it reflect an ongoing digitization project? Maybe you can help. It's a good way to insert yourself into what's happening at the library. Um, and finally, you know, smaller institutions um, are less likely to have a dedicated staff with archiving experience. So their institutional records may be in need of digitization as well. When running a scanning event for the public, it couldn't really hurt to ask if the library has records of their own that need digitizing. It's just another way to really make yourself useful. Um, digitization events at any level often you know, identify needs within a library or library system for future di digitization projects. Um, in, some, in some cases, these projects can often lead to new avenues for access and participation in the collection. For libraries, a new digital collection can become a public history event or exhibition. So in this way, libraries increase patronage and strengthen their communities while preserving and growing their own digital collections. So a lot can come out of this. You know, in April when I had um, Easy Photo Scan and Diana from Digital Organization, and the library as itself recognized that our own institutional records needed some help, you know. And that can really lead to new projects. So it, it's a win-win. All right, getting the green light. Here I just wanted to bring up some important reminders about some formalities of, at presenting at the library. Or anyone else. Um, this information will all be discussed when you formally set up your event. And it's okay to ask. Personally, I don't require a lot of signatures or forms since I set up the programs and individually vet presenters face-to-face. -face. But I do keep an email thread. Um, larger libraries will almost certainly want proof of your qualifications, um, your background information, etc. For me, um, I, I prefer to meet with them to discuss their program ideas and get a sense for their expertise in person. Again, I make sure all presenters understand that as a nonprofit, we cannot allow solicitation of any kind on library property. Um, but that's just us, so always feel free to ask. OK, so now a little more uh, exciting uh, topic. What makes a great presentation? So maybe it's your first time reaching out to the library. And maybe, like me, you aren't formally trained in public speaking. It can definitely put a lot of people on edge. So there's a lot of things that I do in my position as a librarian that was never covered in grad school. And I had no idea I would wind up being a programming librarian, you know, booking presentations that really run the gamut from cooking to paranormal investigators, paleontologists, even a special effects artist. It's been crazy. But um, throughout all of that, I have outlined what I hope will be a few helpful techniques that I've noticed successful presenters have displayed. A good presenter, to me, would be an individual or group of individuals who are just confident, easygoing, well-prepared. Practice is key. Um, it's also imperative that you market your event to your personal network. Now, I've had some presenters be disappointed when there's not a huge turnout. And at the library, we always want our classes to be maxed out. But it's your pro program, too. So please just tell your friends and family, offer to help cross-promote it at your place of business around town, et cetera. 
Um, another big one is uh, effectively using visual aids. And that is really an art unto itself. But you know, you don't have to be a Photoshop pro these days to get some decent color and layout into a presentation. There is a plethora of presentation software you can use. And, you know, it's not just PowerPoint either. There's Prezi and Visme, Haiku Deck, Emaze, Keynote. Um, so just you know, check some of those out. And uh, following up on that would be please stick to the plan. Um, you know, the library will go to a lot of work. Uh, to schedule each class. So by switching dates or the name of your program, it can create a domino effect of all the marketing work that we do on our end. So that would be one of my worst nightmares. <laughs> um, but I think it's uh, also important to mention that engaging your audience is necessary. Um, the library is a public place, and we serve a very diverse population, as many of you probably know. So just understand that you will get folks from all walks of life, and you have to adjust according, accordingly sometimes. Um, it's not always easy, but it can definitely make a presentation run so much more smoothly. So keeping it simple is pretty obvious. When you're prepared and practiced, this comes easy. Laughing at yourself is important, too. Have fun. Make the audience laugh a little. All right, so coming down to the end here, moving forward, how digitization keeps the library young. So this will be just kind of discussing um, how important it is for the library and librarians to be willing to have kind of these, these events, including digitization. Um, you know, I think that most people who have been to a library in the past five years know that the modern library is not just about books. And I kind of touched on that earlier. But, you know, as a free and open community resource, of which there aren't many any longer, um, Sorry about that. <laughs> um, libraries have always reinvented themselves to meet the needs of an ever-changing and increasingly diversified public. You know, you can learn to code, build a picnic table, and change your oil at public libraries these days. Um, I even read recently that a library in Montana led a live demonstration on how to process a deer. It's pretty crazy. Um, the 21st century library is not immune to world, uh, real world issues. So whether you know you need to learn how to use an ebook, find a job, set up an email address, or register to vote, there's so much of our lives depends on technology. And information professionals understand that it's imperative for everyone to be digitally literate, not just young people or the next generation, but all of us. So. Public libraries are in a perfect position to serve their communities in this way and reinforce their importance as they do so. Um, so programs that highlight technology are helpful to the library, including digitization events. Uh, but to me, I think the modern library is about participation and information sharing. We're a place everyone can go to improve their lives in some way, and it's free. So what's more innovative than that? Anyway, OK, so here's some resources. And I wanted to put up um, my, uh, my library's website. Um, this is a link. The second one is a link to the American Library Association Celebration Week. So that's what librarians are going to be looking at when they're planning events. So if you look at it, too, it would be nice to line those up. Um, that's the bibliography for Chase's calendar of events. Great place to get ideas. And if you want to learn more about libraries, um, even if it's in Florida or elsewhere. The final link is the link to the Florida Department of State Library. So, um, but anywhere you are, you can check out your state library website and ask for more information there as well. So thank you so much. I hope I didn't speak too fast. And I'm very thankful for the opportunity to have uh, hopefully been helpful. But I'm going to hand it back to Rick. So here he is. Wow, thank you so much. That is just cram pack. The questions are starting to come in. If you have any specific questions, go ahead and write them down. But there's one right here. Uh, Colleen, you had said something about writing an email. And um, would it be appropriate to get, so it says, would it be appropriate to get a scheduled appointment so that you could enter, basically, I guess they're saying here, basically get and talk to them. And, and if you did, what would that go, go like? 
Thanks, Rick. That is a good question. Um, you know, I think that's how you and I met, actually. So, yeah, it definitely works um, well that way. When you get the information for the right person, I like to have something in writing, like I said. So send me, send, you know, your librarian an email with a little information about how your class would be formatted. Just send me your, your business website. I want to make sure that you're a real person, you know. And um, I would like to set up any meeting face-to-face -face because, as I said before, that's kind of how I get a good um, understanding for a person's profession and their expertise and their background. Um, it's, it just, it's a lot easier to work that way. So I would definitely suggest doing that. And we've got another one. And Diana, um, maybe you can uh, kind of add a little bit to this, and then we'll let Colleen answer. How far in advance would you start? Because like you're talking about, I know April is the uh, library's preservation month. And they look for a special week, the last week in April to do that. And Diana, could maybe you spend a few moments just sharing with everybody how far in advance it takes for you to get started on some of your programs. And then Colleen, maybe then at that point, you can kind of chime in and let her know, you know, yeah, get more time and you're cutting it closer. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Uh, when I first started with doing library events, I was thinking, oh, well, maybe a month or two out. Um, but quite frankly, I think you need to be thinking even further out. So. Um, for example, for April, you really, my guess is December to January. I'm, I, me personally, I find that a lot of the libraries are at least a quarter ahead. Um, now, it doesn't mean that you wouldn't be able to schedule something, but some of the things that that might affect is, for example, you might be able to present, but you might not be included in their quarterly newsletter or their monthly, you know, publication. Um, also, by, by thinking ahead, it allows the library to you know, p help promote. And as Colleen was saying, you know, each of them have different ways of and policies on what they w are willing to do for you. But by giving them as much time, that is really, really helpful. Um, I also found that, you know, just being really upfront and asking them, you know, how can I help? You know, do you need me to create a flyer or do you guys create your own flyers for your event? Um, and then also sharing logos and, you know, just information about what you're going to be doing is, is really helpful. Um, and the other thing I was going to add, when you do approach them, um, be prepared that you might get a little pushback. As Colleen was showing you, you know, your first call may not really be talking to the right person. And I remember calling into the Maitland Library and being told that, oh, you know, we don't have, you know, outside vendors, you know, presenting. And it wasn't until I think I either sent Colleen an email or left her a message and specifically mentioned um, Preservation Week that I think that started our conversation. So, you know, just be prepared to do your research, as she said, you know, and start ahead so you have the time to build that relationship. Thanks, Diana. You're absolutely right. You know, um, at, at my library, and again, I'm a small, we're a small library, and that will vary from library system to library system. But often you're dealing with people who are also the marketing, you know, department. So, um, personally, I like to have at least two months, and that's important for a lot of reasons. Uh, like Diana said, uh, just getting the word out there. You know, you don't want to go to all the effort of having this uh, program and, you know, only having a couple people show up. The more time we have to promote it, the better. Um, generally, since I'm good with um, computers, I'll do a little graphic, you know, because people are just very visual beasts. You know, we'll put it on our Facebook page, we'll print out flyers, do bookmarks, and, um, you know, that really helps draw in the crowd. So it's important to give yourself plenty of time. Um, thank you for that question. That was very useful. Okay, so here's another question here said that their experience has been um, uh, fairly limited um, and the library plan far in advance. So I think we've addressed that how far in advance should we go. So I think we're good on that one. And um, Somebody's asked, how much money <laughs> is in, a, in these stipends when you're approaching a library, or you know, how, how do you calculate that? <laughs> uh, very good question. So um, that is definitely going to vary widely depending on what type of library you're working with. Um, again, you know, I think I had, it was one of my first slides that listed the type of types of Florida libraries. So, um, you know, a 
a library, a county library system is going to have you know up to 10 branches sometimes. They're going to get a lot more funding because their tax base is larger. It, it just it makes fiscal sense to understand that they're going to have more of a budget to go around than a single you know community or city library has. Um, you know, that's a good question to ask the librarian or a manager of public services when you sit down with them to talk about putting together your class. Because um, there's not a number I could give you. Um, I know for us, sometimes when we have cooking demonstrations, we'll have our chef um, purchase all the ingredients and we'll just reimburse them for it because that's all we have. <laughs> um, but. So definitely have to ask your librarian. And you can be very straightforward about it. Just say, you know, sometimes there are stipends for events like this. Is that something that you can offer me? If not, you know, you'll have to consider whether you want to do this on a volunteer or, or outreach basis. That's going to depend on you and your resources. Um, so just ask. And Diane, I think maybe uh, just kind of to add that, since we've done some of this uh, together and then separately as Absolutely. well. And I know we've spoken a lot about the um, opportunity to connect to the community and not to give too much away um, during an event, but to basically kind of get them excited. And so I'll ask you and Colleen a, a question. Maybe you guys can, can team up on this one. And that is, um, you know, Diana, what are you taking into consideration when you do this and the time and energy and resources? And then Colleen, where, uh, where do you really draw the line as far as making sure that, um, you know, you said you can have your brochures. I've never been to a library that's never let me have my brochures. I put a tablecloth out and I let them know and people, and they, they encourage, oh, go talk to the guy. He'll do it for you at his office, that type of stuff. So let me, um, let me go ahead and, and Diana, why don't you address that first and then Colleen can follow up. Well, absolutely. And as, as a small business owner, you have to, you know, kind of weigh the, the benefits and the energy that you're going to put in. Um, in the beginning of my business, I, you know, I was interested in just getting in front of people and, and doing any presentation I could do. So it was not a matter of, you know, and I and frankly, I, most of the libraries I've ever worked with are not, they're usually not going to pay for these presentations because they have a lot of opportunities to have that and people that are willing to present, um, you know, on a volunteer basis. But that being said, that, you know, I do understand that I'm going to keep it to a, you know, a shorter, more concise presentation. Um, and I also do separate workshops that are, that are paid, but they, they aren't hosted at libraries. So you just have to tailor your presentation. Um, and, and ideally, if you have a, if you have valuable information, these are presentations that you can be doing multiple times or, you know, at, you know, different locations as well. Um, also, I would recommend to consider your market and make sure that the the patrons of that library and their group matches what you're going to be working with. Um, I definitely found that, you know, certain locations in my community aren't the best fit for me, um, where other locations are a perfect fit because I know a lot of potential clients are going to be there, even though you know, I'm not I'm not selling my services, but I'm I'm building visibility, and I have had a lot of people that that attended an event at a library eventually become clients. So I find that it's a it's a great opportunity for marketing, but I am conscious of where I'm spending my energy and how I tailor the event um, to make sure yeah. it aligns with what I need. You're totally right, Diana. I think it's so important to know your audience. You know, that's that's what I'm getting um, from that. Um, and when it comes to tailoring your presentation for a library audience, you it's essential to work with the librarian on that together. You know, um, it's it's difficult to bring the same presentation everywhere you go. You know, it's it's just not going to work. Um, but as far as Rick's question of where do we draw the line at um, commercialization, um, you know, I think I mentioned a little bit earlier that if we have an author signing, for instance, we allow them to sell their books. Um, when our friends in the library has a book sale, they're selling books. Um, so if we have a musician, for instance, come in, we'll allow them to sell their CDs because it's related. And the library has a music collection. The library obviously has a book collection. So it supports library missions. Um, so when it's outside of that, that's, that's where we have to draw the line. And again, 
this is my the library I right now work at. This is Mason's rules, and it will be very different depending where you go, especially if the libraries um, you know fundraise for themselves, for instance, then they're allowed to use their funding and their space for whatever purposes they want. Um, so you just really have to ask the right questions to the right people. Um, but you know, when you sit down to put together this presentation, um, that ha that's going to be part of it. And work together with the librarian. She'll know her or he will know his audience um, who comes to these things. And that's really important. Perfect. And I'll just add one other quick thing um, from our personal experience. Um, you know, I think what Colleen has done is if you get to know the library and you're in there and you're seeing other presentations, attend other other programs and just see what they are. I mean, heck, I'm coming to the paranormal thing next time. That's crazy. February, she says. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we got another question here. It says, can you uh, recommend a successful program uh, for this kind of event? Like if, if somebody came in to you today and said, we want to do this, um, what would get you excited about it? And, and what kinds of things could, could folks put in their emails, could ask in their interview when they walk into the library to meet with the program's director, that type of thing, Colleen? Thanks. Um, yeah, I think when uh, I would be looking for um, a well-crafted email that, you know, isn't a paste and cut, you know, um, a cut and paste. Like, I can tell when you're just changing the name and sending it to 20 different libraries. Try to tailor it um, to that particular library. Um, give us examples of when you've done this in the past. If you have brought your presentation to other libraries or you've maybe brought it to a festival or a conference. You know, we'd like to see some past results. I think that's super important in the vetting process. We just want to make sure that you are who you say you are because, you know, we don't want to have, you know, spam events, basically. Um, it, like anybody else, it, it, it just makes sense. So in your email, um, definitely include some images or pictures of these past events. Um, Maybe even a short outline of the format that you would like to see. Um, if it's a three-hour program, it might be more difficult to find time to schedule, for instance. But if you can tailor that presentation into a one-hour event, it's a lot easier to find a time slot that will work for you. Um, and please always leave your contact information. So um, I want to be able to see your website. If you have a portfolio, you know, whatever social media you're on, um, your blog, you know, leave me everything you have uh, because I'm going to check that out before I go ahead and schedule anything. Um, and again, just being well prepared makes the, uh, the best impressions. So what I'm hearing from you, I think, Colleen, is that basically getting to know the library makes all the difference in the world. And then I know it's been, and Diana, maybe you can add a, a little bit here, I know it's been very um, useful for us then to use them as a reference to the other events we've done. So I was at the Palatka Library, or I was at this library, and I did that. Do you find the same thing, Diana, when you start speaking to other librarians? Absolutely. Once you get the ball rolling, it's, you know, it's easy to then mention, you know, listen, I spoke at this private school right across the street from your library. I'd love to present a similar um, talk, um, that type of thing. Or to be able to, to mention, like, Preservation Week in April or Save Your Photos Day, to be able to say, hey, I've done two other Save Your Photos Day events, you know, in the past two years at these locations. You know, is this something that you'd like to you know, start at your location. So that definitely, definitely helps. And then also, I would say to, you know, not only do you want to have the links to your information, but also links to, you know, the APA website or the, you know, Save Your Photos Day website or Preservation Week, because that also demonstrates that you understand how your content will fit into these, you know, nationally accepted, you know, or recognized um, celebration weeks. That's exactly right. I mean, when you connect with something, I know when we got started in this a number of years ago, before there was even the Save Your Photos Day, we were members of the National Digital Stewardship Alliance out of the Library of Congress. So we would kind of use that as our intro. Hey, we work with the Library of Congress. Well, that opened up all sorts of doors for us. And I think that with the things that we've done in the hundreds of events and 
tens of thousands of people that have been involved with Save Your Photos Day over the last couple of years, you've got a great intro to that. There's another question here, but before I go to the questions, I want to let you know that Colleen has put out her top five tips. It's in a handout there for you. Um, it will also be available um, for you afterwards, but if you see on the bar the handout, you might want to download that, one of her top five hits, maybe just something that you want to, to think about working on. There's a question that says, how do you go about mitigating the risk of uh, damaging materials if I guess they're talking about if they were scanning or something like that? And um, I'm going to go ahead and take this one, Colleen, and then you tell me if I'm on on track. I know every time we do an event, we treat it just like we do our Save Our Photos Day events, and we have the customer or the, the patron at that point sign that they are going to let us touch their photos and do that, and we let them know, and of course we're extremely cautious when we go through and we have that, that dialogue, but um, Diana, do you have any other thoughts? We have them actually sign that, that, um, that uh, uh, waiver that we're touching them, dealing with them, and, and uh, I'll let Colleen, say if that covers it for you guys, and, and, and Diana, um, do you have any other suggestions? Yep, I, I mean, I, as you were saying, you definitely want them to be signing off on the fact that, you know, they're giving you permission to be dealing with your photos. Um, also, when promoting your event, if it's a scanning event, I always like to tell people, um, yes, it's going to be a live event. We are, you know, going to take your photos and be working with them, but you'll be returned the originals, you know, the very same day, because sometimes people envision you taking their photos away, and it's important for them to understand it's all going to stay in that, that space. Yeah, I think that Diana's right about that. Um, sometimes when you're setting up the program with your library, they might have their own sign-off sheet, so you're definitely going to want to go over that um, as you're planning your event. Um, and it is important to understand that you're going to get a variety of library patrons, you know. Um, like I mentioned before, we are open to everyone. So uh, you'll get people with very to little, no digital skills or knowledge. You know, they, they might uh, think that it takes uh, two weeks to get their pictures back. So it does involve an amount of explanation. So I think the format of your presentation should have some kind of introduction in the beginning always. You know, you're not going to go directly into scanning people's um, items before making sure that they fully and completely un are aware of um, how this works, you know. And it's exciting for them, too, when um, I know that uh, a lot of our patrons um, are really interested to learning new digital technologies, you know, and they'll be like, you can scan um, my old 35 millimeter slides, and they'll be really excited about that. So, um, you know, these, these are not professionals. Uh, these, these are just people from all walks of life. So. Um, get to, getting to know your library, again, is a super important part of this process. I'll add one other thing to that as well. Um, all these are good information, but um, we do set limits so that when folks come in, um, you know, they bring in uh, all sorts of things when they do their events with us, and, and um, we, we look them right in the face and say, gosh, this would be a great item, but, you know, here's my card. Please see us afterwards because we're going to need you to come to, to our office or we'll come to your place or whatever and do it for you there because I need a special piece of equipment or I want to take extra time and extra care with that. So um, all of those great, uh, great ideas should help you along with the equipment part. Um, finally, I, there's, there's one other question here, and I want to bring it up. It brings two, two points to, to mind. Um, something that we've always tried to do when we go to a library is we ask the, the librarian to, to go out and find books that are already in their library collection that might be things that they might want to feature and have them out on a table or on a cart alongside where you're giving your presentation. It's a great way to kind of get people thinking about some of the resources and other digital types of uh, tools. I know we were in a library and they had a whole video series um, that they could that you could check out and, and, and look at on how to use Photoshop and that was a great one and people said, oh, I didn't know you had that here. And, oh yeah, here's how you can work with your photos. So 
take a look, and I think in your interview you may want to just ask those kinds of questions. Hey, do you have anything in your collection? Can we go down and look at it together? They'll love to show it to you. I don't even know. Do I put you on the spot? Do you know the Dewey Decimal number for uh, the photo section? I think there's uh, it's the uh, 700s, right? Okay, yeah. yeah. It's the 700s, and after that you're on your own. I think it's the 740s, but I, I won't go any further than that. But to that end, if you had a book or you were writing a book or something like that, I'll ask Colleen, how would you get that book in, in a library? How does the library actually get their photo books? So you've got a book you want to recommend that said this would be, how would, how would somebody do that? That's a great question. Um, so it depends, as always, everything depends on the library. But for us, uh, we allow our patrons to make uh, suggestions for purchase. We call it suggestions, but usually we'll order the book for them um, because that's the type of collection development policy that we prefer as a small city library. Um, we call that patron driven. That's patrons asking for books and we supply them with them. Um, for other libraries, they will be, um, uh, they'll have a different system where they just receive books um, as they come out from publishing houses. Uh, so it, it really runs the gamut, but you know, as a user of a library, if you see a library with a lacking collection of you know, photography or um, supportive materials for your business, you are very welcome to always make a suggestion um, because libraries would like to fill in that gap. We want to have a basic general knowledge book on nearly every subject. Uh, that is the goal. So you're always welcome to make suggestions. Um, and yes, we do like to have book displays at these events. You know, it, it supports um, library collections. And we want to make sure attendees are aware that these materials are here and they are available for checkout. Um, you know, the more checkouts that libraries get, that's a statistic we keep and it helps funding. So every book that's checked out matters to us. Um, so we're going to make sure you know about that. Um, and we're also going to tell you about our databases that may support other digital initiatives, like um, if we, our website is uh, getting a new photo exhibit, you know, of historical photos. Um, that's also related information. So if it aligns with the library's existing collections, whether that's you know um, electronic or print, um, we're going to want to support that and cross promote that. It's a big part of these events. Well, super. Where well, our time is winding down, there have been so many great questions, Colleen. I cannot thank you enough for participating today. I know a lot of folks have uh, gone out and done some work with libraries and, and others are just like, I wish I could, but I don't even know where to start. And my goodness gracious, with all this information, I think we're all ready to go out and, and touch base with some of the libraries. I think it's, it's an excellent, excellent job. So I want to remind you of a couple of quick things. First of all, we want you to remind yourself that you've got a, um, a handout there that you can download. The second thing I will remind you at is please, after you've checked off the line here, that you fill out the questionnaire in order to be qualified for the prizes that we're giving away this time, as well as we love your feedback. And finally, we hope everybody has a fantastic Thanksgiving. Remember, we've got our Black Friday, Cyber Monday stuff going on, so take a look for some of that stuff. And uh, we've got some unique specials going on over the holiday season. And we'll look forward to seeing you next month where we learn a little bit more about this new way of telling stories. So thanks, everybody, for attending. We look forward to hearing from you next month.